this is David Kahn, the chairman of the Republican Liberty Caucus of Arizona. I'm here with our secretary treasurer, Ben Beckhart and Representative Justin Wilmoth. And I know it's a crazy week with the session coming up. We're so glad you were able to join us. No, oh, thanks for having me and for the, for the time of the fan of your guys' work. So I'm honored to be asked. We wanted to take a moment and kind of give viewers a little idea of what to expect with the session coming up. It's been a crazy year and it doesn't look like it's going to get calm anytime soon. Um, to start out, could you tell people a little bit about who you are and why you got into politics? Yeah, sure, absolutely. Uh, you know, if you go back far enough, I remember being 12, 13 years old, coming home, uh, watching Crossfire with Pat Buchanan and Bill Press back in the day. I, I was interested in politics from an early age, probably the uh, the 92 election with Pro and Bush and Clinton was probably the first one I paid a bunch of attention to. And uh, from there, I was just always interested in civics and history and government. And um, in 2004, I was living in Oklahoma at the time. I helped one of my best friends from high school run for state legislature there. So I drove him around, knocked doors, all those things that we all do. Um, and he ended up winning his race. And uh, because of that, there was some staff changes. It was the first time that the Republicans took the uh, House in Oklahoma in 80 years. Um, and that was in 2004. So they, they got rid of Democrat staff. They brought a new staff and I was one of those guys. And so for uh, 10 sessions in Oklahoma, I was actually a staffer um, for communications and policy there for the Republican caucus. Um, I worked for Americans for Prosperity for a year. Um, I, I've done small and large campaigns statewide. Most recently, Steve Gannon in 2018, but I was a policy advisor here at the Arizona House uh, for two years between 2015 and 2017. So um, I, I joke that I am uh, pretty crazy because I know what I'm getting into and I decided to try to come back up here anyway. Um, but I have a, my whole career has been in policy and government and um, that's very important to me and that experience hopefully will help me to become a, a decent, a good representative. Um, and I decided to run uh, this last cycle because well, Nancy Bartow asked me to, the, the new old new state Senator uh, in district 15. And there was two open seats because she primaried a uh, less than Republican uh, senator, I'll just say. And then John Allen turned out to run for county treasurer, which he won. So I ran with uh, Nancy Bartow and Steve Kaiser on a slate in LD15. And uh, we were successful. Our conservative message carried a lot of weight up there and we ended up winning. And now I'm up here uh, talking to you guys, looking at session in uh, just uh, three or four more days. So it's here. We're having discussions about bills and getting things filed and we get sworn in on Monday. So it's a very uh, independent of everything in DC and other parts of the country. It's a very busy time here in downtown Phoenix as well. Uh, thanks Justin for joining us and congratulations on your election. Uh, just wanted to look ahead to the legislative session. I know you're new and and, is, and there's a lot of crazy stuff going on in our country right now. So, but I don't know, what, what do you expect or what do you hope to see come out of this legislative session with all the issues facing our country with COVID and the restrictions and election integrity and tax reform issues with Prop 208 passing and school choice, everything. So. It's not like there's anything to uh, tackle or talk about, huh? I mean, it's a, it's an avalanche of insanity. And I don't mean that as a negative to anything. It's just think about any other year where so many curveballs happened. I mean, last session was stunted because of COVID, which at the time, you know, it was very weird and foreign and nobody knew what was going on. So they had to react on the fly and it's very tough. Uh, in state government to to turn on a dime like that, right? So um, we have that issue. We've got the um, election integrity stuff uh, nationally and otherwise. Um, we've got a lot of good bills that actually uh, died because of COVID in the process because we shut down suddenly. Um, last session was very similar to going 70 on the freeway and then putting it in, in your car into park. So many things just hit a wall, right? And so one of the first things I can tell you is that there are gonna be fast track bills. And these are bills that are largely have already passed through the process, either in the House or the Senate, and they need to pass through the dance on the other side. And then they're going to have to go to the governor's desk. So they're, they're things like anything from basic, you know, health or commerce bills about business uh, stuff, or uh, bigger things like a COVID, uh, uh, um, what do you call it, a, a COVID a protection bill for businesses. So there's going to be a lot of things that were starting to pop up last year that didn't get to go through the entire process, but had, say, Passed the, passed the House and needed to go through the Senate. Um, one bill I picked up 
Um, one of my first was the bill that Jay Lawrence was running last year and died because of COVID. It was a pharmacy licensure bill. It just clarifies where pharmacists can practice. It's pretty, uh, pretty plain Jane, but it's little things like that that make state government work. So I picked that up because it was already had passed through the House and it just needed to get approval in the Senate. So I think what you're going to see at the start are a lot of fast track bills that are similar language to what was in the process last year. They just re-racked them for this session. We know they're going to pass. They have unanimous, I mean, it's, you know, 60 to nothing Democrat, Republican, bipartisan stuff in a lot of ways, things that need to get through that we're going to push through. And then there's going to be new legislation that deals with, gosh, anything from Prop 208 to election integrity. I, I There's going to be a lot of that stuff. I've talked to different members in regards to 208, where we're going to look at other ways to basically give it a haircut, where we're going to change tax policy in other areas to kind of try to choke out 208 because we can't get rid of 208. Um, the way our state constitution is written with the uh, voter protection and all of that. So I think what you'll see first is the, the fast track bills. And then you'll see a lot of voter integ uh, integrity type bills. Obviously with everything that's been going on, there's a lot of uh, <clears throat> um, clamoring for that. And I'm curious too, I wanna to make things uh, right, no matter who, who it helps, I want to make sure that we have a good system that we can trust. That's what matters to me, regardless if it were to help me or hurt me. I want to make sure that that we can all go vote and feel confident and not feel like we felt this week where we have nothing left to lose, our government doesn't work, it's a failure, let's, uh, let's cause some issues. That's not good either. We can't have that as a government. So you're going to see a lot of that. And uh, again, 208 is going to be a big tackle for us as well. So I think those are going to be some of the bigger things that you're going to see at the start. And of course, over the range of sessions, things will pop up um, that we've just thought about or a constituent or group like you might call us about. And those are always the curveballs that we had along the way. Yeah, it, it should be an interesting session with a lot going on. Um, are there any particular new bills that you expect to be addressed this term? Uh, for me personally or just overall? Just any overall anything that's caught your interest that you you've seen so there's stuff that's recycled like um i've got the uh, pharmacy bill there's a there's a veteran suicide um, measure that will help to fund those protective measures for our veterans because obviously they face so much stuff that we will never see as a uh, normal americans and that's very important to me my brother's a major in the army my grandfather was a colonel in the army and flew gliders in world war ii um, so uh, military causes like that are very important to me because they they literally give put their lives on the line for us and when they come home if they've got uh, PTSD or, or certain issues that uh, stem from what they saw over there we need to make sure that we can take care of them that's something that we I believe as a society we are honor bound to do because of what they did for us um, and you're going to see other things I mean I'm on the I'm the vice chair of transportation committee so that's going to be a, a big focus for me is uh, things that we need to do in the valley and in other parts of the state to keep transportation going because my thought on uh, roads and transportation is, is that it, it provides good commerce. If we can't ship stuff, if we can't get stuff around the state and around the country because of our roads, companies skip going to certain states because of their highway systems. Um, states that don't keep as uh, good of uh, care of their roads as we do. So transportation and commerce, that's another committee I'm on. I'm also on health. So I've got health, commerce and transportation. Um, and the transportation issues, we're talking everything from widening the 101, which is going on in my district, to uh, uh, State Route 30, which is a new planned freeway for the Southwest Valley that'll go from the Durango Curve at I-17, uh, five, six miles south of the 10 over to the 303. Uh, we have tremendous growth in the state because of the good commercial climate that we have, the low taxes and things like that. And so we have to keep up with the demand of, uh, of the roads as well. So that's one of my committees, so I had to plug that. And then, of course, in the health committee, I mean, you're going to, we're going to face pro-life issues, which, of course, I'm 100% pro-life. Um, there's going to be a ton of COVID matters. And um, we don't know exactly everything that's been dropped, because until bills get dropped, uh, there's a certain amount of privacy the members have with their bills. So I don't know everything that's out there, to be honest with you. But as I said earlier, I think COVID, election integrity, those are going to be the two big things. And then uh, tax issues related to 208, because... People that are smarter than me believe there's a way that we can kind of choke out 208 in, as an end around like a football play to where 
yeah, two eights there, but we can choke it and it won't get any revenue if we do certain things correctly. So I think that's something that we're going to uh, see a lot over the first month of session. And of course, we have to have our bills over to the Senate um, in mid to late February. So it'll really start taking off uh, after uh, this, this first week will be kind of slow. Most committees aren't meeting. We have opening day on Monday, we get sworn in. So really it'll be week two that'll start the uh, 18th, I believe it is. That'll be when things really start to uh, get brisk down here. But uh, I think those will be the big stories of the year is COVID, election integrity, and uh, you know uh, how we handle all of that. And uh, also uh, checking the governor's emergency powers. That's something else that I, I was talking about earlier today, which I'm in, I'm in favor of because um, the governor is an executive. He's, he's a co-equal branch along with the legislature. We serve different purposes, but one is not ahead of the other. One is not above the other. And as we found this year, um, after we signed, he died. I wasn't in that, the 54th legislature, so I did, had nothing to do with that. But um, when the legislature signed, he died, they can only come back when the governor calls them in, or if we get two thirds vote, which is 40 votes. And with a 31 seat majority, we would need nine, nine Democrats, which is why we weren't able to uh, gavel in uh, since the election to debate those issues, which again, I wouldn't have been in that even if we had uh, been able to get uh, a super majority into uh, have a special session. So I think that's going to be an issue too, is the question of legislative and executive. What does that look like in the state? What can we do as a legislature to uh, check, not just the current governor, but any governor in these uh, emergency situations? Because uh, emergency declarations have a time and a place, but we can't have it go on forever. And that's something that I know is very concerning to me and other members of my caucus. So it's going to be another issue, I think. Yeah, that's definitely a top issue for me, just addressing that and checking that balance of, the, of power that the governor has so that the legislature can do more and so that, you know, representatives of the people can give the people a seat at the table at how our state responds to COVID. So we're not having too many of our liberties taken away. Um, but and just as far as like activism with the uh, and with the session and the format with COVID, I don't I know I saw in the Senate that um, they don't want, you know, people coming into the committee hearings unless it's their time to testify and stuff. So there's going to be a big limit on how the public can be involved. Uh, I don't know if you have an idea what to expect in the House. Is it going to be like that or different or? You know, it's uh, here we are the Thursday before the Monday of the first of session. And we're not entirely sure yet. We've heard similar things um, that we're going to only allow uh, sponsors or supporters of bills or lobbyists or whoever's connected to come in and speak about that bill at that point. So in the past, we know that we have the committee rooms, people can sit and watch the entire thing. That's usually what happened. When I was a policy advisor, I would sit and watch my committees and just take note of what's going on. Uh, what I've heard the latest is, is that that won't be the case, that we won't necessarily have an audience, that all the members will sit in the committee areas as, as normal. We've got these uh, hockey plexiglass things that separate us. So, uh, we have that going on, and um, I guess what I was told, and I'm just a newbie freshman, so I have no power in the decision making on this stuff, but um, when it's somebody's bill, if it's house bill, whatever, you would come in then and you would speak to your bill and answer questions about it, and then when we were done with that, you would leave. Um, I'm more in favor of if there's 50 seats in a committee room, take out 25 and spread them out a little bit and let people be in. That's what I would prefer, honestly. But um, I am not in that position. And uh, it all rolls downhill when I'm at the bottom being a first year guy. So um, I think that's what's going to happen. But guys, I got to be honest, it's Thursday. It could change three more times before Monday. I think that the combination of being sensitive to people's concerns, media optics, um, things like that, or it's like trying to nail jello to a wall, right? And so um, I'm not quite for sure how it's going to look, but I think what you said about the Senate is probably going to be what's happening. But um, I think we're just going to find out, to be honest with you. And I hate to, I feel like I'm dodging your question, but there's been a lot of moving parts to this. And I didn't even know until, what is today, Thursday, until like Tuesday, that I'm going to be able to have guests. And so instead of having four on the floor, like we usually do, new members only are going to get two guests in the gallery. So there's, I think there's 10 or 12 new members overall in both caucuses. And all of us are going to get two guests, and those are going to be the only people that are going to be allowed to sit in the in the chamber gallery. Um, so the day of the joint session, where we've got 90 legislators, uh, four guests for each House member, the governor speaking in person, it's not going to be that this year. The governor is giving his 
address from his office. I don't really like how opening day looks, guys. It's not anything I would have wanted, but uh, it's what it is, and it's what we're going to work with. And even given the crazy environment, I'm excited to get in there and fight for guys like you that we're all like-minded individuals and conservative uh, uh, freedom, liberty kind of causes. And this is just where we're at. So that's kind of uh, what opening day is going to look like and what committees are going to look like. But I got to say, I've uh, watched a lot of committees over the year and years, and I don't know how that's going to work and be effective. I think it's probably too much caution. Um, and again, I ultimately feel like that it's up to the individual. If you don't feel safe going out, don't. I'm, I'm not going to hammer that. I think we're going to have opportunities for uh, speakers and bills or supporters to uh, come in via Zoom because we've got TVs in all those chamber and those, all, all those hearing rooms. Um, so I don't see why we can't have more people in, in the chamber. And then if somebody is sick or has a compromised older grandparent or something, I mean, I want to be sensitive to that. But I don't think that we should throw everything out just on the idea that we can't have people sitting next to each other. But that's where we're at. So I guess we'll see how it looks. And um, as it stands for me as a member, there's been some debate on, well, should we allow remote voting and stuff like this? And as long as I'm standing, I want to do everything in person. I didn't campaign for a year, year and a half to uh, sit in my office in my house and, and not be here and be in it. So that's very important to me. And that's something that I'm going to at least make my opinion known on, even if it didn't change anything, because the only way to get good governance done is to have in-person conversations in my office uh, at a lunch somewhere, wherever it is, you need to have those interpersonal communications. If you guys wanted to come down here to my office and talk about something, I would want you to come down and have that access because I'm just some dude. I'm not anything special. I'm a guy that ran for office. I feel like I'm a conduit for the members, uh, for the constituents in my district and for good uh, freedom and liberty ideals. Um, so I don't want to be kept from all of that because I don't want the government to be seen as opaque or behind closed doors. And I worry about this being that over an issue that is important policy-wise, but we have to be really careful because one-time emergencies have a tendency to turn into permanencies as we know with things like TSA and, and all of the post 9-11 stuff. So we have to be very careful. Absolutely. So I've had a lot of conversations over the past several months with people who after this election, very much want to stay more involved and want to make sure their voices are heard on the state level, and they're just not familiar with how that operates. So I was wondering if you could talk a bit about how the average citizen can best engage the legislature um, in terms of how, is there a particular medium they should use to contact legislators, and also different points in the process. Um, so I know that when a bill is in committee, you have a very different situation than when it hits the floor. Right. Um, so yes, there's many ways. Obviously, and it goes with that saying, vote, be engaged, read up on your candidates, find out about people like me, make sure I'm your guy. Um, that's the first step, right? So take part in the process, vote in the primaries. Um, as we all know, the primaries don't get near as much attention as the general election in November, but it's like the playoffs to the Super Bowl. Um, that's the first round. You've got to win that round to advance. You've got to prove that you're the right uh, person for your party or for the voters in your district. So pay attention to your candidates first off. But after that, now we're in the phase where you're stuck with me for two years at least. Um, you can call my office. You can email me. It's uh, jwilmoth at azleg.gov. So it sounds like azleg. It's at azledge, but jwilmoth at azleg.gov. So you can email me anytime. Um, you can become a PC. So it's so important, um, no matter what district you're in, and I'm in District 15, which is pretty much all of North Phoenix between Scottsdale Road and 67th Avenue, north of the 101 and south of uh, Carefree Highway. Come to your LD meetings. In LD 15, I believe it's the first Wednesday of every month. I'm gonna go every month and give my report and my thoughts on what's going on in the legislative session. And uh, those meetings are filled with PCs. So I would suggest if you really wanna be a part of the process, you become a PC. Um, there are elections for that every two years. Uh, after that, if there's openings in your precinct, you can uh, apply to become one and your district chairman will uh, review your application and, and, and put you in a in your precinct if there's a spot because it's a mathematical equation that deals with the number of Republicans registered in your district and Democrats. And so like in my precinct, I think there's 17 Republican slots and they're all full. But I know that other parts of my district, there's some precincts where there's 
Republican openings and openings for the other parties too. I believe there's libertarian ones too, and of course Democrats. So um, that's the best first way if you're not sure how to be involved. That's a great way to do it because you'll run into uh, great activists that that campaign and are active and know their stuff, and they can bring you along and teach you a lot. And then you can come to the meetings. And look, like I'm an open guy. Like if I've got time, shoot me a text, meet me for coffee. I'll meet you wherever I can because I'm not doing this for vanity or anything else. I want to do this to be a good servant to the people of Arizona. It's very, very important to me. And because I was a staffer up here at the legislature, I know what needs to be done. And I have that heart to serve because I was already in here um, helping members help their constituents. And so now I've moved up to the next level. Uh, we'll see how I do on that. But I always want to be open to people. If I can't meet with people, it means I'm busy or I'm on the floor, I'm in a committee. But, um, you know, we'll have Thursday afternoons, all day Friday. We won't be, we typically don't meet in session those times. So there'll be opportunities uh, to meet with me. And again, like, let's go have a coffee. Let's go have lunch. We can talk about anything. We can talk about nothing. We can talk about, you know, hockey, baseball, whatever. It doesn't matter. I just think it's so important for legislators to be open to uh, their constituents. And unlike with congressmen and senators in, in D.C. that legitimately have insane schedules, um, legislators on this level want to meet with their people for the most part. I don't know very many on either side, even with Democrats that want to avoid their, their, their people. So all it takes is contacting the office, put, put, a, put, put, a, uh, put yourself on our radar and we'll, we'll find a time to meet with you. It may not be tomorrow. Usually we probably need to schedule out about a week for meetings just because that's how it goes up here. But um, I can tell you now and anybody listening or watching this that if you're in my district and you wanna meet me, I'll give you a tour of the Capitol, come on in my office. It's as simple as that. But I think the way for most people to be engaged is to be PCs and then they can run for state committee men and then they can vote for the leader of their party. So you can become very active and you can make it as much or as little as you want. Um, it's not a full-time job, but you can put a lot of work into it when you get experience and the connections to uh, do so. And so I, I encourage that because it's the PCs that help people like me uh, get elected, the people that are uh, on fire to help the conservative uh, freedom, liberty kind of side of the equation of, of the political spectrum here in Arizona. So I owe those, those folks everything. It's the only reason I'm here talking to you today. And so to that, I say, I want more people to get in the cause and, and fight and harass me, make sure I'm being accountable to them. And uh, let's all do this together because we're all in different lanes. I'm in one lane, PCs and, and district chairs and other people are in different lanes. And we, we're all going in the same direction pulling for the same policy or having discussions about policy and what it needs to look like. And I want to have those conversations and I want them all day. So there's ways to get involved. I believe they, I think there's, is it how to be a PC.com? I believe there's a website out there on, on there and on the instructions you can do to get through that. Um, and um, if that's not the right side, I've got it saved. I can find it for you guys later, but it's very easy to get involved. And really it's just a matter of a calling your district chairman and asking, how do I get involved? Yeah, we definitely encourage people to everybody to sign up as a precinct committee man so we can reform the party and just keep it about the principles of liberty and small government. Um, I think it's BFPC.com. Yeah, that's it. Yes. Yeah. Um, but yeah, and we do a lot of, of the Republican Liberty Caucus. We do a lot of activism during the legislative session using RTS and and uh, we try to do a Liberty Lobby Day every year where we head down to committee and testify for some bills and just meet with legislators. Hopefully we can do that again with, with the COVID restrictions. Um, and then obviously we use social media. We post video highlights from, from committee hearings and, and floor sessions and post action alerts for people. Uh, and then we do a scorecard at the end of the session, uh, just score the, all the legislators on how they voted, making sure they voted for smaller government, individual liberty, free markets. So uh, maybe we'll see Justin Wilmoth at the top of that scorecard after this session. I hope, I hope to be. I mean, that's where my heart is. Um, I that's my that's my plan i mean I, I don't want to get sidetracked for sure and there's a lot of pitfalls up here obviously because we're dealing with a 11 billion dollar budget and there's arguments to be made for funding in certain areas but i don't want to grow government in fact when people ask me about priorities i i wheel out my favorite political quote which is from barry goldwater and he said i came here to repeal laws not pass them and so that's where my heart's at um that's what i want to do and um I've got a bill working on that's not quite ready to be talked about yet that I think is going to be a, a centerpiece for me this session that's going to hopefully tackle those kinds of things. And, um, and, and again, the pharmacy licensure bill is one of those things where it's streamlining pharmacy regulations uh, with the idea and hope that 
they can practice in more places and that's good for the economy. That's good for people that need to get their uh, medication filled. So that was the reason I took that on because I believe that to be a good uh, ex expansion of Liberty Bill, I guess is what I would call it. And it's very ticky tack. It's not going to make the news and it's not sexy, but it's stuff that we need to do in state government to ensure that we keep the government streamlined and going in the right direction. Because if you don't do that, it can get unwieldy pretty quickly. And that's not something I want to be a part of. Oh, and I guess I should say, we talked about the processes and I, you mentioned RTS. So uh, anybody in the state, you can sign in, you can come down to the Capitol and speak to a bill. I know COVID, I don't know what that's going to look like, but you can use the RTS system to keep track of bills. And it's on the uh, legislative uh, website, azleg.gov. And you can poke through and find the connections to get to it. And you can follow any bill you want. You can pull down my name and find the bills that I've sponsored and follow the process of those or bills about anything that you're interested in. And um, so those will go through the committee process and then they go to floor for what's called Cal, a committee of the whole. And so the committee is a, is a group of nine to 12, it varies. And the members of that committee will be the first round of bills in a certain area. So say a COVID bill on health, it'll start there. We'll debate it, discuss it, vote it. If it passes out, it'll go to uh, the full house for a discussion in Cal, that's committee of the whole. And then it'll go to a third read vote. So there's some stuff I've skipped over there. There's amendments and all that stuff mixed in. But essentially that's the process. There's um, committee conversations, committee meetings, votes, uh, committee of the whole conversation and then third read vote because every vote every bill has to be read third time so it's introduced that's first read it's uh, assigned to a committee second and then it's on the floor for third and then if there's amendments or changes that happens and then when it passes it goes over to the senate for the same treatment if it's changed in the senate it has to come back to the house for if i'm the author to go okay i agree with those amendments if i don't i reject them and then i request a conference and that's kind of toward the end of session where we hammer out the House and Senate exactly like, okay, well, what's this bill gonna look like? How are we gonna address this COVID matter? Uh, and then we fine tune the, the language and then both sides agree and then we vote on it, it goes to the governor. So that's a very, very, very quick explanation of how the bill process works in the state. And again, any, anybody can keep track, with, uh, keep track of it on their uh, website, on their computer. And of course, if you have Cox Cable, I believe it's channel one, two, three, where you can watch a legislative sessions um, on your TV. And then on the website, you can watch the uh, committee hearings and uh, things like that. So there's a lot of ways to get um, to get involved. And uh, those are definitely the easiest ways is just hook up your computer and, and fire it up. Uh, thank you again for being able to join us. Yeah, thank you again. I, I appreciate the flexibility with the schedule. I've really enjoyed this and I'm just glad we were able to make it work. Absolutely. Have a great day. Thanks, Justin. Hey, thank you guys. Take it easy.